I'm Julian Gooding, and welcome back to a, another episode of Changing the Narrative as we explore more about what structural racism is. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about today are two topics, really. Uh, when you talk about structural racism in America, and it's one of those things that I have heard quite often said to me uh, when it comes to being an American. And that's actually what exactly is an American? What exactly is patriotism? And the other thing that I wanna talk about, of course, is voting and understanding how powerful voting is. I know when I was growing up, older teen, I oftentimes would be at a party and I would exercise my American right to express myself, especially when I heard some kind of injustice being said. And when I would stand up for myself or the rights of other minorities, I would oftentimes hear this phrase that you hear today, which is, well, oh, you can leave this country if you don't like this country. Or your comments are somehow un-American when you decide to exercise the very rights that our Constitution says that all Americans have that right to expression, that right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so on. So I'm often puzzled by America when they talk to a black American especially, or minorities in general period, when they say something like, you can leave, get out of our country, go back to Africa, go back to Mexico, or right now people are saying stuff like, go back to China. So what exactly is an American? So when I think about post-Civil War, the Reconstruction, so here are these Africans that are now by the President of the United States being given the honor of being African Americans, proving that they weren't uncivilized, but they were very civilized by being able to figure out how to navigate in the new world, America how to be part of that American dream, how to follow the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. These men went from being in the field as slaves to being judges, lawyers, congressmen, governors, lieutenant governors, sheriffs, the list goes on and on. And I say men because unfortunately women weren't given the right to vote yet, but these men, these black men, these African Americans proved that the democratic process does work and the power of voting, that's the most important thing and the most powerful tool still to this day. That these black men who were enslaved, the first thing that they did was vote other folks into office that look like them. Sometimes they put themselves in those political situations in one elections to represent the American dream that all men are created equal. These men with that power created societies, created communities, put in infrastructure in cities, built schools, built wealth. Blanche Kelso Bruce was born into slavery in Prince Edward County, Virginia, and went on to become the first elected African-American senator to serve a full term. John Roy Lynch was a writer, attorney, and military officer. Born into slavery in Louisiana, he became free in 1863 under the Emancipation Proclamation. In 1873, Lynch was elected as the first African-American speaker of the Mississippi House of Representatives. In Louisiana, Oscar James Dunn was one of three African-Americans who served as a Republican Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana during the era of Reconstruction. Pinckney Benton Stewart Pinchback was an American publisher and politician, a Union Army officer. Pinchback served as the 24th Governor of Louisiana he was one of the most prominent African-American office holders during the Reconstruction era. And right here in South Carolina, there was Richard H. Kane, Francis Louis Cardozo, Robert B. Elliott, Richard Theodore Greener, 
Robert Smalls, Alonzo Rancière, Jonathan J. Wright. Black men held seats of power from Alabama to Washington, D.C. Out of the hundreds of black men who served during the Reconstruction, about 98% of these politicians are not part of our K-12 education. Here's the thing that's the most amazing, that during the Reconstruction, right after the Civil War, these men put themselves in positions of power where they could have put in structures and laws and rules and regulations and policed white folk, sought revenge perhaps. But the most amazing thing is that the spirituality of these men came forth and they proved that they understood exactly what the American dream, what the forefathers who even owned slaves hoped to do was build a better nation. These men didn't seek revenge, but instead they created inclusion. They created communities where white folk could live alongside them, work alongside them, and prosper together. The power that they had as governors, lieutenant governors, as judges, they did not use that power in an unjust way against white folk. They put away the anger and they decided to help create this country, America. If that's not being a true patriot, being a true American, I don't know what is. Now, what comes to mind is Wilmington, North Carolina being one of those cities that I talked about during the Reconstruction, where black men and white men, communities were living side by side together, forging this wonderful nation peacefully. A handful of men come together in Wilmington, North Carolina. In a matter of weeks, they start to create that narrative that later became the foundation for Jim Crow laws. They created this hate and started to spread the rumors that these black folk have too much power. You can't allow a black man to have power, that these black men are going to somehow seek revenge and put you perhaps in bondage. You have to put that under control. You have to keep the black man in place. And within a matter of weeks, this wonderful, prosperous community that was multicultural was razed to the ground, destroyed. All because of the power of the vote. So I ask again, what makes an American? If you ask me, if individuals are working hard to destroy the right to vote of another American, that is treason. For minorities in America, we've proven time and time again that we are perhaps sometimes more American than those very individuals who are screaming and shouting at us to go back to Africa or, or go back to your homeland, wherever that may be. You're not a true American. And here in South Carolina, Isaac Woodard Jr. was a decorated African-American World War II veteran. On February 12, 1946, hours after being honorably discharged from the United States Army, he was beaten while still in uniform by a South Carolina sheriff. His name was Linwood Shull. The sheriff jailed Woodard and continued to beat him and gouged his eyes out with a billy club. He survived, but his eyes were damaged beyond repair. The sheriff was indicted and went to trial in federal court in South Carolina, but he was acquitted by an all-white jury. The attack sparked a national outcry. The NAACP and filmmaker Orson Welles used the power of the media to reach the White House. Through political pressure, President Truman established the Civil Rights Commission by executive order. Truman was the first American president to speak to the NAACP. In July 1948, over the objection of senior military officers, Truman issued Executive Order 9981, banning racial discrimination in the U.S. Armed Forces. But the support 
President Truman gave to the NAACP in banning discrimination in the military nearly cost him a re-election, simply because he was trying to eradicate racism from our country. The opposite outcome happened, though, for President Woodrow Wilson. We teach our children that Wilson won the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to found the League of Nations. But we don't teach that he was one of the architects of systemic racism. Wilson was a segregationist. He wrote a history textbook praising the Confederacy and the Ku Klux Klan. He secured his re-election by supporting and debuting the racist film Birth of a Nation at the White House, thus giving more power to the Ku Klux Klan and intensifying voter suppression against African Americans. And many of you think that that's something that happened in the past, but it's happening right now. See, if you put in people that represent you, respect you, care for you, right away systemic racism and those individuals who participate in those acts of systemic racism, the first thing they want to do is voter suppression. So just how powerful is voter suppression? In Louisiana in 1896, there were over 130,000 black registered voters. By the 1900s, after new state constitutions and with new voter registration qualifications, there were only just over 5,000 black registered voters. In Mississippi, the number of black registered voters decreased from over 52,000 in 1876 to just around 3,500 in 1898, without a decrease in the state's black population that was eligible to vote. Using Jim Crow suppression tactics that started in 1877, there has not been a black person elected to any statewide office in Mississippi or Louisiana since the Reconstruction era despite the fact that the states have the highest percentage of African Americans in the country. Do the math. The year is 1877 to 2020. In fact, a 2013 Supreme Court decision invalidated a key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The very act that Martin Luther King Jr. died for and John Lewis was beaten and jailed for. Because of this gutting of the Voting Rights Act, many Southern states today have begun to use Jim Crow suppression tactics. So what is voting purging and caging? Voter caging is a tactic where a political party or organization sends registered mail to registered voters that they have identified to be unsupportive to their candidate. All mail that is returned as undeliverable is placed on what is called a caging list. The group then systematically uses the list to challenge the registration or right to vote on the grounds that if the voters were unreachable at the address listed, then their registration is fraudulent. Now we have voter purging. If voter purges, well, that's not necessarily a bad thing if done properly, are good means to ensure that the voter rolls are accurate and up-to-date. Some critics of the process for purging, such as the Brennan Center for Justice, feel the process is shrouded in secrecy, prone to error, and vulnerable to manipulation. Another aspect of voter suppression, felony and over-policing, is oftentimes used to control the voting process. Statistics show that whites who commit simple assault or simple battery end up with a misdemeanor conviction. But in many minority and poor communities, especially in the states where racism thrives and politicians seek power, a simple assault ends with a felony conviction. Having a felony and voting eligibility varies from state to state. In Maine and Vermont, two of the whitest states, you never lose your right to vote with a felony conviction. So you can see how a bad police officer can affect one's right to vote. Another form of voter suppression, 
the racial weight gap. Studies have shown that Latin Americans and Black American voters were more likely than white voters to wait in the longest lines on election day due to the lack of, say, voting machines. And did you know that states like Texas can close a polling place because of the lack of foot traffic? So they can shut down a polling site at 5 p.m. just when the average hardworking citizen gets off work. And then there's confusing voter ID laws. Prior to a successful challenge by the Campaign Legal Center, the state of Texas disenfranchised over 600,000 registered voters who did not have the type of ID Texas law demanded. For instance, a state licensed to carry a handgun, which may be legally obtained by some non-U.S. citizens, was a permissible form of identification while a student ID or even a veteran's administration ID was not. And do keep in mind, if you live in one of these communities where you have access to voting machines and polling places, and perhaps you have no problem, do keep in mind that the tunnel vision of hate can sometimes trickle over and cause problems for your world as well. See, your silence, or maybe you are being silent on purpose, or maybe you just aren't aware of what's happening in America. Suddenly your mother and father who are senior citizens who would normally mail in their vote, or perhaps should mail in their vote during a pandemic, suddenly can't do so. Perhaps you live in another state and your mother and father are in an assisted living situation and they can't get to a polling place. This has nothing to do with race. Remember I said it has to do with a whole cross section of America when such evil and such hate comes into play. It will affect everybody eventually. You see, keeping silent during these moments where voter suppression is being put into place will eventually affect you. It's just about humanity. It's about love and kindness. It's about the American process, the democratic process. Young people continue to agitate, continue to make good trouble. Let your voices be heard. You're going to be taking over this nation. So make certain that the vote stands and make certain that voter suppression is eradicated. But don't do it with violence. Do it through the vote. Use the power of voting. And don't be upset if you don't get the nominee you wanted. Sometimes I hear that being said that I want this person to be the president of the United States or the governor. And because that person that I wanted to be governor didn't win, I'm not going to vote at all. The nominee that I wanted didn't win, I'm not going to vote at all. No. If you've got 10 points, right? A checklist of 10 things that you want to have happen. And seven of those tasks on the list that are important to you are checked off, that this person is capable or willing to do for you, and those other three didn't make it, you don't throw away and tear up the sheet and say, well, I'm not voting, I didn't get all 10. You vote and you try to get the best possible candidate you can, get come very close to that person, but you don't throw away your vote. We've proved time and time again how powerful voting is, that it created Jim Crow and the KKK. So we know the power of voting is effective. Sometimes we don't get what we want right away, but you have to vote. And you have to vote all up and down the ticket, not just for the President of the United States. You're not going to necessarily have that growth in your community, that success in the community that you want. You're thinking, oh, I have to do something up here. No, it starts down at the bottom levels. To find out more information, visit some of these websites to learn your voting rights, to make certain that you are on the polls, to make certain that you have the proper ID in place, to make certain that people are not creating conflict. Structural racism exists. It cannot be denied. And we have to work through the voting process and continue to educate ourselves 
and then go out and vote. We have to be able to have these difficult conversations. Some of the books on my book list that I highly recommend that you take a read if you wanna find out just how much black Americans have taken part in the shaping and the making of this country. American Founders, How People of African Descent Established Freedom in the New World. The Black Cabinet, another fantastic book to read. The Untold Story of African Americans and Politics During the Age of Roosevelt. I'm Julian Gooding and thank you again for tuning in and listening to my discussion on changing the narrative and understanding structural or systemic racism and how we can celebrate being Americans and celebrate this American democracy and understand that all men are created equal.